So welcome uh, everyone to, to the workshop on learning from other sectors. I'm Andres Hueso Gonzalez and I'm joined by Alex Lebru as, uh, from the organizing committee in chairing this session, which aims to connect lessons from solid waste management and from waste picking to advocacy and research on sanitation workers or on fecal waste management. And uh, we want to draw from lessons from across the world. And I'm delighted to have a very powerful and, and global panel of speakers to learn about this. So we have uh, Sonia Diaz joining us from Brazil. She is the Global Waste Specialist at WIEGO, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. We also have um, Christy Braham from the Workers, who is also at WIEGO, but joining us from Belgium. And she is the Workers Health Coordinator we have Lakshmi Narayan from the Kagat Kachpatra Kashtakari Panchayat, uh, which is a waste pickers union in India. And Nalini Shekhar also from India. She is the executive director of, of Hari Sudala, an organization of waste pickers um, also from India. And finally, Dr. Isaac Rujemalila from the uh, UG Mazingira Waste Pickers Association in Tanzania. So we will have a series of um, eight to 10 minutes presentations from each of them, followed by 30 minute discussions. And um, I think um, we will just go straight into, into the content, into those presentations. And um, yeah, the speakers can then add anything to their, to their bios and, and introduce themselves live as they speak so that we can keep this um, agile. And the idea is to break after the uh, two presentations to have any clarification questions and then have a longer question and answer towards the end. So without further ado, let me uh, invite Sonia Diaz to, to start uh, with her, her presentation. Sonia, over, the, over to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share our uh, work on um, waste speakers in this uh, forum, which is a very, very important forum. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I will we'll very quickly uh, highlight some key uh, actions and issues around COVID-19 and health impacts on waste speakers uh, from the uh, experience of WIGU. Uh, so very quickly, WIGU is a global action research policy advocacy network that seeks to improve uh, the status of the working poor, especially women in the informal economy. And this is done through increased organization and representation, improved statistics and research, uh, advocating for more inclusive policy processes and for equitable trade, labor, urban planning and social protection policies. And we work with four sector groups, street vendors, waste pickers, domestic workers, and uh, home-based workers. So just to give uh, an overall idea of what uh, we uh, talk, what, who, is the, who are the way speakers and some of their contributions? We're talking here very, with a very broad kind of working definition around way speakers being those who collect, sort, and or process household, or commercial and industrial wastes, be it on streets, in cooperative sorting uh, facilities, or in open dumps. And they, these workers, they can work independently as non-organized or in various cities across the world, they have managed to organize themselves in cooperatives, in associations, in unions, in micro and small enterprises. They may work individually or as a family unit. And I come from Brazil and my country and my continent, it's home of one of the strong strongest uh, cooperative movements around the world. Uh, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, we have been organizing, uh, waste pickers have been organizing themselves since the late 80s. Well, when COVID-19 hit us, 
uh, uh, last year. We quickly at Wigo uh, were uh, busy to produce and share information on COVID-19 and safety protocols and to uh, devise and share tools and policy recommendations to support advocacy efforts and to influence policy processes in order to include informal workers in general uh, demands uh, into relevant policies to uh, counter effect, uh, the counter the effects of COVID-19. We early as early as uh, uh, March, we start the rapid assessment mapping on social protection. We started designing our global study, 12 cities that uh, my colleague uh, Christy will speak a bit about uh, this uh, study. We started a tracking process from in different countries and globally in terms of the la uh, in terms of local and national policies on COVID-19. In my country, we started a mapping of impacts on Brazil, uh, on Brazilian cooperatives. And we started a global advocacy on vaccine for workers and essential worker status. And at the same time, we were busy helping in terms of uh, organizing and supporting emergency aid efforts and campaigns in uh, Africa, Asia, America Latina, and support uh, uh, workers to have access to PPE and food baskets and accessible information on protection, and also providing support in terms of communication uh, for uh, the organizations linked to us. Here we have one of uh, the health gu guidelines that we produce uh, in March. And uh, it lays out uh, a lot of, uh, of um, recommendations on COVID-19. This stemmed from the work that we do here in Brazil. And this was translated in uh, more than 12 languages and spread very quickly across the world. Uh, so as I said, we started uh, mapping of impacts of the pandemics on cooperatives here in Brazil. Uh, we have in Brazil a reverse logistics uh, uh, program and due to connections that we have with some of the uh, industries that uh, work uh, on a specific program for the reverse logistics the reverse logistics is our EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility Program. So uh, using that database, we mapped in our first phase uh, as early as April and May, uh, what was the operational status of the cooperatives? What were the initial impacts in terms of health production and the coping strategies? And we managed to, our sampling was around 130 cooperatives and we managed to have 86% response of, out of this sampling. And then later this year, we started a second round uh, mapping to see what was happening in again in terms of the impacts on health production access to vaccines uh, to map the trends on uh, uh, on the sector and again we had a, a sampling of uh, uh, around 143 cooperatives so here a brief overview uh, while into in 2020 uh, following uh, a recommendation that we in Brazil, some organizations that we belong to, we issued to uh, uh, stop uh, collection of recyclables so that we could work out the safety protocols needed for the workers to perform their activities safely. We had uh, uh, in last year around 73% of the cooperatives who stopped their operations. And we saw that this of course had an impact uh, which meant 28% drop in gross revenue. And uh, at that point, when we did our mapping, we had 51 cases, suspected cases of COVID and one confirmed case of COVID. And this year, again, in our mapping, we saw that 80% of the cooperatives were already functioning uh, normally. 
we had an increase in the reported cases of COVID-19 from 51 suspected, we had 895 cases. And we saw an increase in gross revenue because here uh, there was an increase in the prices of, uh, of recyclables. And uh, we mapped the coping actions, so we found out that our, the cooperatives here, they were busy creating campaigns to support their cooperatives uh, to cope with uh, the pandemic. They were busy implementing and supporting technical people to develop safety protocols, and they were also uh, busy trying to uh, address uh, the issue of basic income uh, grants uh, for, for waste pickers. Uh, this year, our uh, sampling, uh, we saw that the cooperatives were engaged in a lot of training education courses. One of the courses, the Cata Saúde Viraliza, that was uh, appeared in our uh, findings, and I'll talk about this. It's an initiative uh, from Wigo. And they were busy supporting NGOs, companies, and public authorities in terms of adapting and comply, and also educating workers to comply with the protocols, and also doing uh, advocacy for priority access to uh, vaccination. We see that uh, in our sample, while in Brazil, by the time we had the samples, 69% uh, of our population had already had at least one shot of the vaccine. In our sample, 79% of the way speakers had already been vaccinated. And several municipal governments declared priority vaccination for way speakers cooperatives in their respective municipalities. We could see that cooperatives, what stands out in our sampling, it's uh, uh, how cooperatives function as a cushion uh, to absorb uh, uh, impacts in economic crisis. So now just a brief overview of a project that we, as we go, we implemented in Brazil. This is an online capacity building project for way speakers, organized and non-organized way speakers. And we got funding from OHS, the Open Society Foundations, to work with way speakers through a WhatsApp capacity building course to deal with issues related to threats and opportunities to deal with issues in uh, building uh, their capacity around COVID-19 and also to address coping strategies. Our course began in March, 1st of March, which is the International Day for Way Speakers. And we started with 514 participants from all over Brazil. And we uh, had a process in which we divided our participants into WhatsApp classes. And also we used Facebook as a library for, uh, uh, for content. It was uh, a content very flexible, a course very flexible in terms of taking into consideration illiteracy and also building capacity for the participants on how to use uh, WhatsApp, how to use uh, for capacity the building and how to use tools like Meet and Zoom and etc. so that we could overcome the, uh, the uh, distance uh, that we had to keep in terms of uh, not being able to do in-person meetings. So some of the main achievements, uh, uh, there is a high level of adaptability and flexibility in the course, a good balance of topics and the course uh, helped uh, was a safe space for workers to exchange experiences and ideas. So drawing to a close, uh, what can we learn in terms of thinking forward? We need to continue investing in building informal workers' capacity to deliver in complementarity with formal systems. And in the, issue, in the case of uh, pandemics, we need to build their capacity to be on the digital space. 
we need to uh, continue uh, de-stigmatization -stig campaigns in Brazil. This was crucial, and this is, might be a learning for the sanitation sector as a whole. In, in the 1990s, in my city and also nationally, we had many activities around de-stigmatization. De these stigmatization campaigns. I can talk on the QA a bit more about that. And this was crucial. Also crucial is the need for multi-sectoral alliances in which we can have different actors come together to support, raise the voice and visibility of workers. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. And um, yeah, really, thought-provoking uh, presentation and, and conclusions there for us to, to discuss later. But um, let me go straight to our next speaker, Christy Braham, also from Wego. Please take the floor. Thank you, Andres, and thank you, Sonia. I'm just going to share my screen. Um... Oh, can everyone see that? OK. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. OK. Um, right. Hi everyone, my name is Christy. Um, I am the Workers' Health Coordinator at WeGo, so I'm a colleague of Sonia's. Um, and I'm gonna be talking today um, about the intersection of um, informal work, um, vulnerabilities and health. So I'm really trying to, um, to, to piggy bank of, of, of all the, the fantastic information given by Sonia and, and uh, zoom in a little bit more on um, the various impact, the various impacts on on um, on workers' health um, that can be posed by by actually doing this work. Um, so again, I'm from WeGo, and I'm not going to introduce um, our organisation because I know that Sonia has already done that. Um, but I do want to mention, you know, I do want to reiterate that at WeGo we work with four key groups of informal economy workers. Um, as Sonia mentioned, it's waste pickers, street vendors, um, domestic workers, and home-based workers. Um, and throughout this presentation, um, I'm going to be talking about our experiences um, with informal economy workers more broadly, but where possible, I will always um, use examples relating to waste pickers specifically. Um, so, we do recognize that waste pickers you know, have been and do continue to be essential workers, um, but they have remained exposed, um, particularly during the, the pandemic, um, exposed in terms of um, absorbing risks to their health and to their livelihoods um, without being protected. So, Sonia did mention this in, in her presentation, um, but one major project that we've been undertaking um, at WeGo has been the COVID-19 crisis and the informal economy study. Um, and this study is, um, has basically been about trying to assess um, the, the various um, forms of impacts um, that, the co that the COVID pandemic has, has, has placed on informal economy workers across the world. Um, so this study has um, been based in 12 different cities. And in the next slide, there's a there's a map of those cities. Um, but this is a longitudinal mixed methods study, um, which has been conducted in in two parts. So there was the first round, the first wave, um, which was between April and July last year. And um, more recently, we have conducted and finalized a second wave um, between June and October this year. Um, and as part of this study, um, we have interviewed around 2000 workers in a variety of occupational sectors. So um, it's, it's quite wide. Um, it's, not, it's actually not just limited to the four key sectors that I've mentioned. We've, it also includes, for example, newspaper vendors in Peru, um, those collect, um, collecting um, cans and, and um, um, in New York City, um, transport workers in Mexico City, for example. Um, so it, it is actually quite wide. Um, and as you can see, we've got some, we've got quite a, a range of publications um, 
that have been sort of presenting the results of this study. Um, and now that our second wave um, has been completed, we are about to launch um, a, a, a whole new range of publications um, um, sharing our results. And I just want to reiterate that um, everything that I say in this presentation relating to the most recent data that we have from our study is preliminary um, analysis. So it, um, you know, we we will have more finalized um, analyses late, um, in the beginning of next year. Um, but everything I have is just our, our preliminary um, results. Um, so this study was conducted across 12 cities, as I've mentioned, you can see that um, we've, we've tried to capture um, contexts across Latin America um, and also North America. Um, we've got one um, European context as well in Bulgaria um, and the rest are comprised of three cities in India um, as well as um, a few cities um, in the African continent as well. So um, I just want to zoom in on some major findings from the two rounds that we've done. So I want to zoom in on livelihoods. Um, so we've seen that workers um, um, are currently taking home only 64% of their earnings compared to what they were earning before the pandemic. Um, and this decrease in income um, has you know, very specific gender impacts. Uh, women are being disproportionately impacted by this. Um, we're also finding that um, workers are working longer hours, but actually um, a reduced number of working days. And for waste pickers specifically, um, we found that 40% of waste pickers, um, the, um, the, the reason why they had reduced working days was due to, to concerns related to their health. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a very, very important, um, has very important implications. Um, for example, this could lead to increased um, vulnerabilities in terms of economic and social status. Um, and that in turn may impact on access to services, including healthcare. Um, now, in terms of health risks, more specifically, we have found um, throughout both rounds of our study that there have been increased occupational health risks across the board, across all um, sector groups. Um, but for waste pickers specifically, um, we have found that nearly 60% of waste pickers um, surveyed have reported increased exposure to, to COVID-19. Um, so that, that is um, one of the major um, OHS risks um, currently. Um, and in terms of uh, preventing these risks, uh, we found that almost 80% of waste pickers um, um, have had to fund and supply their own um, personal protective equipment, um, whether that's masks, gloves, um, aprons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they, you know, there was very little support given um, by local authorities and, and, and governmental agencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and lastly, we have found that more than 60% of waste pickers have not had access to water at their collection sites. So the, at the places where they're collecting their materials. Uh, and so taken together, um, waste, pick, uh, waste pickers and other informal economy workers have really been at increased exposure to, to disease, to infection, um, which obviously has impacts on their health, but ultimately, can also impact on their ability to work further down the road. Um, so I just want to hone in a bit on vaccination. So this um, was taken from, um, is, this is preliminary data from the most um, recent round um, of our study. So we've, um, we found that there's a low rate of vaccination um, amongst workers of all um, sectors in most cities. You can see that um, um, Ahmedabad, uh, Delhi, um, uh, in particular have, have quite high rates. And that's actually because um, our data collection in India um, took place at a later stage compared to other cities um, because of the, the, the very serious wave of, of COVID um, earlier in the year. Um, and of course, New York City being in the global north um, with greater access to, to, to vaccines um, does also ex help to explain that higher rate. Um, but it's, and even though this is not shown on the graph, 
I, I can tell you that only 29% of waste pickers um, across all of um, our global cities um, reported having received at least one vaccine shot. So the, the global picture does, you know, does suggest that vaccination um, you know, is still at very low levels um, and that workers are facing some levels of barriers on this. So we have one one minute left, more or less. Sure, sure, sure. So I will I will hurry through. I'm really sorry, I'm taking a bit too long. Um, so major barriers to vaccination we're finding are that vaccines um, are not reaching workers in their location because most workers are located in countries with lower access to to vaccines um, due to global inequitable dis distribution of vaccines. But also, of course, there is a lot of hesitancy and misinformation around vaccines. But that does obscure the picture and, and, and really the reality is a, a lot more complex than this. I would have, if I had the time, I would read out these quotes, but I just wanted to make the point that um, we are hearing about workers being fired and losing their jobs for getting vaccinated. Um, and of course, um, you know, if, if, if you're a worker and you're hearing of that happening within your sector, you know, that can play a role in, in, um, in hesitancy in, in not wanting to be vaccinated. Um, these are just two examples of some of our membership-based organizations at WeGo, um, where they have done a lot of on-the-ground advocacy um, with regards to gaining access to the vaccination, some fantastic work there around conducting outreach um, with, um, with their members and also advocating for recognition as essential workers. Um, and I can, I, I'm happy to talk more about this um, in the Q&A. Um, so, but what lessons does this have for sanitation work, just quickly? So we need inclus inclusive public health strategies, including vaccination, including testing, et cetera, which protects workers' health. Um, but also we need wider social protection initiatives, which protect um, workers' livelihoods um, and um, in, in the event that they get sick. Um, we need to continue to support um, and resource mutual aid groups and organized groups, uh, organized and unorganized groups of workers. And we must absolutely capitalize on this crisis to continue to advocate for improved occupational health and safety frameworks, which include waste pickers and other workers. Um, I'm happy to, to go into more details in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Sorry for the time crunch. Um, I wanted to check if um, there are any any questions uh, from the from the audience. Please, in that case, uh, type them in the chat box or use the Q and A um, tab. In the meantime, I had um, just a quick question for for both of you for. Um, well, Chris, I wanted to, to hear if you have any suggestion in terms of how that support and resource of mutual aid groups, uh, could, what that could look like. Uh, and, and from Sonia, also similarly, what does this, this stigmatization that you have suggested, what, that, what would that look like? So if you can, yeah, just a brief response to, to that. Um. Sure, thank you, Andres. So in terms of, supporting and resourcing mutual aid groups. So what actually, why I didn't mention this, but one, one part of um, our study was also about asking for workers' demands. Um, you know, what do they feel, what do workers on the ground feel that they need? Um, and we're hearing a lot about um, um, either um, providing, you know, of, of course, um, uh, you know, resourcing support. So, you know, trying to, to support with um, finances, but of course we're hearing a lot about being supported to, um, to build momentum on the ground, um, to, to support their advocacy, adv advocacy campaigns. Um, and a lot of that right now is around vaccination. A lot of worker groups on the ground, um, are talking about, um, the need for information, reliable factual information that they can share with their members um, in order to, um, to, you know, to, to fight against really rampant misinformation and hesitancy and uncertainty around what it means to be vaccinated. And that's one thing that we're trying to do at WeGo at the moment. So we are um, working with MBOs and, um, sorry, membership-based organizations within WeGo and also 
um, other um, organizations on the ground um, in terms of trying to produce um, awareness, uh, awareness raising materials, um, which really give a lot of the facts around vaccination and, and COVID more generally. Um, and we're really hoping that, um, you know, increasing access, um, direct access to this information, um, you know, directly to those groups can, can play a role in that. Thanks, thank you. Okay, so I think for uh, destigmatization campaigns, the key issue is for us to take culture into account when you're planning to do so. Uh, when I, I was a government officer in my past uh, life, so to speak, uh, in the 1990s, uh, when we took up the position in our municipal cleaning agency, knowing how both former workers, those who sweep and collect uh, waste, you know, formally employed, and also informal workers, they were stigmatized is stigmatized. So what we did in our city was to organize, taking into account that Brazilians uh, like, you know, carnival, like art, music, we devised in our city a carnival parade that ran alongside the main event of Brazil's, the carnival, famous carnival of Brazil. It took place a week before and we use a lot of recyclables to make the costumes. We, the city, together with formal, any formal workers, were on the parade, you know, all dressed up, and we were raising with our population that this is an important work. This is one example. Another example, but now at the national level, inspired by the experience of Brazil, late uh, Belo Horizonte, my city, later on, UNICEF, uh, invited us to think about waste pickers in general, particularly children, uh, child work. So with the help of UNICEF, we created first a campaign, a national campaign to destigmatize the work. And later on, we even formed a multi-stakeholder forum with the backing of uh, UNICEF. I'm happy to post some links here so that people can have uh, better information on it, more details. That would be great, thanks. And I think we have a question from Alex. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Christy, very fascinating presentations. And um, I was wondering, uh, Sonia, you said at the beginning that you managed to create a safe space for workers to exchange ideas exchange experience among each other and in the sanitation worker space that's something that is starting to happen with the pan-african uh, sanitation workers association i wonder how you managed uh, to create that safe space and foster it well uh race speakers in brazil have been interacting with one another for quite some time we have a national movement of cooperatives which was formed in 2011 uh, and we have had some in the past three to four years we started whatsapp groups you know getting together with workers and us you know people who support them ngos different ngos not only we go and so when uh, COVID-19 struck us, what we thought was, well, given that we already have some workers who are already interacting with one another on, on WhatsApp, why don't we make the WhatsApp the environment for the capacity building? That's why we issued a call People enrolled, made registration, signed the consent to be part of a, of a WhatsApp uh, groups, and it it was a forty two kind of a, a project. It has a lot of strategies which I won't be able to uh, go into detail here. But overall, I think the most important thing is, again, something that is a feature of the work that we do at Bibo. We take advantage of culture and art. We do a lot of artivism and art mobilization and art education. I work with a team of uh, popular educators who are also artists. And these kinds of help 
uh, at least with Brazilians, uh, you know, to create like a safe space and to create the empathy and the kind of cooperation uh, environment that we managed to build within Cata Saúde. I'll post the link to our page, which has a lot of details. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Um, so let's let's move on now um, over to to India, and um, we have Lakshmi Narayan first um, from the KKPKP Waste Pickers Union. Lakshmi, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sonia and Christy for laying the foundation and explaining the work of Waste Pickers. Just sort of makes it easier to talk about our journey in Pune. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk more specifically about exactly what we did in Pune and what kind of organizations of waste pickers we set up and how they evolved. Uh, we started working with waste pickers in Pune in the year 89-90 and uh, it, the very first uh, thing we realized when we were interacting with waste pickers is many of them didn't look at their work as work. If you ask them what they did, they said, we don't work, we just go around and collect waste. So it was not even considered work and we felt it was very important to establish to the workers themselves, to the city, to citizens, to the state, that this is extremely important work. It's important from the point of view of the environment. It's important from the point of view of recycling, from the point of the municipal solid waste management system, because it's reducing municipal solid waste management costs. It's diverting a large number of uh, recyclables from the landfill and therefore extending the life of the landfill. And it's also feeding them. So they form the base of a large recycling pyramid which uh, actually employs a very large number of people, scrap dealers, the people they employ, reprocessors, none of which would have been possible if there were not waste pickers who were going through the garbage and retrieving paper, tin, plastic, metal, glass, etc., from mixed waste. So uh, the very first thing we felt it was important to establish is the identity of this group as workers and for them to recognize their own work as work. And that is why we decided to register as a trade union. Kagat Katz Patra Kashtakari Panchayat is a trade union. It translates as Paper Tin Metal Workers Association. So they're collecting that scrap. We believe strongly uh, that this is obviously not waste, but it's a resource. We go with the uh, word waste picker as a label for the sector because it's easiest for them to identify with that because that is how the resource that they're retrieving is seen by most uh, societies. Uh, we started with arguing with different kinds of groups that the work of waste pickers is environmentally valuable and sustainable, economically viable, it sustains them, it's socially inclusive and therefore one needs to give it some recognition. So our very first demand was that waste pickers need to get an identity card that is recognized and endorsed by the city. At that time, when we started in the year 1993, the municipality was not willing to recognize them as workers. We went to the police because a lot of issues that waste pickers face in many cities is that they are very often criminalized. The question of who does waste on the street belong to gets raised very often. So if a waste picker is caught with waste, where did you get that waste from? Is it really waste? How do you, how can you prove your ownership over it was one of the issues that was frequently asked. So in the beginning, since the municipality was not open to recognizing them as workers, we asked the municipal, the police commissioner to actually be present and preside over a ceremony where identity cards were issued to waste pickers. This public program happened in the year 93, and although the police didn't even endorse the card, simply the fact that the card was issued by a policeman, by the hands of a policeman to a waste picker in a public place, empowered the waste pickers to start demanding accountability of the police and stop taking their harassment quietly. There were a number of cases in those days where cops would routinely accost waste pickers, stop them, keep them for the day, ask them to empty their sacks, ask them whose material this is. But uh, just the fact that this was a public visible program, it was covered in the press, waste pickers started speaking up. A lot of waste pickers, uh, when they were caught by the cops, would say, I belong to the union and you'll have to call up my union if you're catching me. So just a simple piece of paper that identified, registered and recognized them was enough for them to use to fight in public spaces and with authority. And uh, of course, they used it far more creatively than we intended. Many of them used it for credit. If they didn't have money, they would keep their iCard and they would say, we'll come back and take it later. There were people who were taken to court and they used it as a, a guarantee, which again, it was not meant for. But it's, it's, to their, um, it's to their credit that they were creative enough to use just a simple piece of paper to advocate for their own identity and for their collective bargaining. The other thing we did after that is 
try to quantify to the municipality uh, with the help of waste pickers, the actual economic contribution of the work they do. We did a, a study which we did in collaboration with the International Labour Organization and managed to actually uh, quantify the total diverse, the waste that they diverted from the landfills and therefore the amount they saved the municipality because the municipality is paying or spends around a fixed amount per ton for handling waste. And our argument was that if waste pickers are saving so much money, in return, you need to give them something. We also, along with this formal research, did a lot of advocacy, did some public programs. Like Sonia said, we use a lot of media and visibility uh, around a day which is celebrated in India as uh, a ceremony, as a festival. We made bracelets, something like friendship bracelets with uh, waste and tied it all around the municipal building. And we asked the municipality to endorse the icons. Because of this, the municipality agreed and the waste pickers started having identity cards that the municipality recognized as municipal icons. This was a big step forward because it was some indirect recognition of the contribution of the work of waste pickers and of the fact that what they were doing is meaningful and it helps the municipality. So as we moved on from that gain, we started arguing that the municipality should cover the waste pickers under an insurance program. Again, our argument being that they save you so much money, the least you can do is cover them under an insurance program. Again, the municipality, after a lot of advocacy and some studies that quantified, again, the exact value of their work, agreed to do that. And waste pickers since 2004, waste pickers of Pune, the municipality pays the premium towards their insurance. Now, the amount that they spend is not really very big, but the big difference is that waste pickers' health-seeking practice changes immediately. They start going to hospitals, they start interfacing with public health services because they know that that is going to be reimbursed if they claim it. And typically, say, going to quacks or not going to the medical uh, care system at all definitely changes. So that kind of difference was significant. Uh, the most important changes that happened were actually after that. Our argument later started as municipalities started privatizing waste collection. We realized that without establishing that the waste should belong to the waste picker, without arguing that it's hers by right, there is no use of an I-card or of insurance program. These two are supportive mechanisms which work only if she first has access to waste. So as privatization in municipalities started, in Pune, we argued that instead of privatizing the work of waste collection to any private entity which may or may not hire waste pickers, why do you not give it to a cooperative of waste pickers? Uh, the municipality was very hesitant. They were not sure if a waste picker who typically goes around with a sack and collects waste, who's entering the bin and fighting with animals for her waste, is actually going to manage to provide a good, regular, reliable, efficient service. So we decided to take on a pilot. And after a year and a half of the pilot, the waste pickers very comprehensively demonstrated that they were actually willing to change their lifestyle. They were willing to change their work hours. They were willing to use a push cart instead of a sack. They were willing to go in a clean uniform. They were willing to go at a fixed time. They were willing to wait for a whole month to get their income because typically a waste picker sells her scrap and gets money at the end of a day. When she has to go around house to house and collect waste, she's changing her terms of work actually. She's getting a monthly salary paid by citizens at the end of the month and she's getting her scrap sale once a week. But the waste pickers demonstrated to their credit that they were willing to make a very big shift in their terms of work. And due to this, the municipality agreed to ensure that the waste pickers were registered into a cooperative called Swatch, which has the formal waste collection contract for the city of Pune. Today, around three and a half thousand of the 8,000 waste pickers of KKPKP are part of a cooperative called Swatch, and they are offering a waste collection service to around 80% of the city of Pune. There is a lot of up and down and conflict with the municipality, which doesn't renew the contract on time, but there is a formal contract with the municipality to collect waste. Again, like Sonia said, we've also been working with scrap traders, tried and registered cooperatives of scrap shops so that waste pickers get a better deal and they can move up the value chain. We are also engaging in extended producer responsibility kind of discussions with producers of plastic to make sure that difficult to recycle plastics are effectively recycled and these companies are willing to pay the viability gap funding to make that possible. We've been uh, arguing for recognition of waste pickers, not only at the city level, but at the state, national, international levels. There's a, uh, we, with the support of Vigo, there's a global alliance of waste pickers or waste picker groups across the world, which has been advocating at the COPS, at ILO, at um, UNEA for ensuring that there is a seat at the table for waste pickers in all negotiations and a recognition of waste pickers 
in all international, national, and local policies to do with waste and with informal workers. We also work with civil society organizations because as we work with the states, state, it's equally important for civil society organizations, for middle class citizens, for other urban poor to also recognize the work of waste pickers and not isolate them completely from that kind of sector. So broadly, this is a scope of work we've done. Today in Pune, we have four organizations, mass-based organizations of waste pickers, all working with a different mandate, with a requirement for credit, for arguing for workers' rights, for integration and livelihoods, and for adding value-added services. That's broadly the kind of work we're doing. It's always a struggle. COVID has impacted them negatively. They were recognized as essential workers, but not provided everything that an essential worker should get. So all those struggles still continue, and we're still very much battling on all those fronts. But it's definitely uh, clear that the process of organizing and mobilizing has meant that they have a strong visibility, identity, and space in the city that they can negotiate with. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Lakshmi, and really, really interesting and inspiring experience. Um, we will take questions after uh, Nalini's uh, presentation. So over to, to Nalini from uh, Harisu, Harisu Dala, also in, in India. And uh, please, um, participants, you can start if you have any questions already. You can put them in the chat box and we'll take them after Nalini's presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Lakshmi has done most of my work, so I don't have to get into many uh, issue. So I worked with uh, Lakshmi in Pune. Um, so I come with a similar background of understanding of uh, waste pickers. But um, we started working in Bangalore in uh, 2010. Um, and the city is very, very large, much larger than Pune where I had worked. So as um, uh, uh, Lakshmi was telling, our intention was social protection for the family, integration of waste pickers in the solid waste management. So um, to achieve this, uh, because it is a very big city, we had to apply many other different kinds of uh, strategies. And uh, uh, we also did a study which showed uh, almost uh, one, four, I mean, 8.5 million Indian rupees was saved for the city uh, with the transport collection and transportation alone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we also argued that waste pickers should be given identity card. Then what we did was we said uh, we don't want to own um, our data. Uh, we want the city to own the data. We want the city to own waste pickers contribution. So we insisted that uh, the logo of the city and signature of the commissioner was very key. And today what the ID card they get, which is uh, displayed here is identical to the ID card the, the, um, the mayor of the city gets. So we were very keen that uh, we work within the system of the government and they should own, own, their, own the relationship. So this has also happened because of my background in Pune, what uh, gaps I saw and we were able to uh, uh, push it here. So um, then uh, we started working on um, identifying and uh, getting them ID card and the say and the best because we're very happy six months okay I mean okay our harassment with the police has come down the harassment with the administration has come down we now have the right to pick up waste after six months they came and said so what what are you going to do with more than this for us so uh, Bangalore and like Pune were already contracted out its door-to-door uh, -door collection so we really had to uh, brainstorm on how to integrate waste because we definitely knew in 10 years you will not get the recyclable on the street that they were getting in 2011 because I'm sure uh, we were very sure that the cities will become more efficient. So once uh, when the city is inefficient in collection of waste and uh, waste pickers fill up the gap of uh, uh, the gaps that is left by the city. So if there is no gap or reduced gap, where will the waste picker go? So we were very keen um, uh, to work on right to waste, continued access to waste. And um, at that time, the commissioner, we went to the court uh, to get an order to get ID cards, then integrate them into a decentralized waste management system and uh, which uh, Bangalore was pushing to do. So we said every, we have 198 administrative wards in Bangalore. We said every ward should have a driveways collection center and that should be given to waste picker. 
then commissioner said where is the space in this mega city you know there is no space and you're asking us to come up with an infrastructure how can we do it so well today we have 141 driver's collection centers so it was possible and we had to as lakshmi was telling we have to uh, move the uh, entrepreneurs who were just on the street on their own at their own will they would go on their own uh, will uh, they would stop the work or one day they could take the break but when you are providing services that kind of a thing will not happen so we had to bring them to uh, uh, how do we professionalize their services so that was a biggest challenge we had and uh, um ways because proved that they can definitely do that and then we said we want these driveways collection center a picture of it is here and we want to manage this so um, the city in the beginning was not very keen and then they said okay let's try it out so we did the tri trial like this and then uh, we had to break the monopoly of the contractors there were a lot of cases going on in the uh, courts and then uh, we did a, a pilot where waste because volunteer to collect door to door waste uh, of only dry waste that is only inorganic waste that they are proficient in uh, once a week or twice a week in about 4000 households so in one and a half years we proved to the citizen that this is a better system where dry waste is taken up by waste pickers so your uh, solid waste management system is better segregation is better on the corner street there is no waste um, piled up and uh, they were also uh, were very impressed with the dependency they had in the services so um, so we showed that and we really pushed the government uh, to make this happen so the first time the government had uh, mou or the agreement directly with a single waste picker entrepreneur now of course a, a group of uh, uh, waste pickers they have an um, mou with them to run the driveways collection center now that was extended to collection of waste on a trial basis for 3 uh, 3 years and it really went well we uh, we covered about 33 driveways collection center we also wanted to bring all these uh, experiment in the legal framework so that we are not thrown out one day so so we started uh, initial advocacy with the uh, with the courts and then uh, we had uh, 15 mous directly with the waste pickers and slowly we increased that and uh, finally uh, the uh, bbmp that is our local government um has uh, signed up agreement um actually in 2018 itself what happened was we showed in uh, our city how to work the dwcc and the state government in its budget uh, budgeted uh, construction of driveways collection center in all cities of karnataka not only all cities all village of karnataka so that became a model to work and also push waste pickers to be integrated into managing this driveways collection center so only last year we got our um, uh, you know uh, policy um, of the state this is a waste is a subject of the city the state government gave the framework for how to integrate waste pickers and now the bylaws which is the 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 most important thing and uh, in the bylaws uh, of uh, bangalore in 2020 they decided that there will be two contractors one contractor the traditional contractor who will collect only organic waste and sanitary waste and dry waste will be collected by uh, either waste picker collective waste picker or a uh, you know women help self help group so this was a big 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 uh, um, you know win for us because the contract system was going on for almost 3 decades and uh, there was no way of integrating our waste pickers into that and even we did not imagine that will happen we thought we will limit it to dry waste collection center where the contractors will come and give us the waste and we manage it but we were able to push that and today the mega city of bangalore all the dry waste is collected by the informal waste workers now of course into the formal system so we really looked at as lakshmi was saying how they work with the citizen we also work with the citizen what we looked at is good quality waste needed to come and in pune they were already struggling there was no segregation of the sanitary waste so women had to open and see what is what is the waste in it and and it was quite hazardous so we promoted in 2011 a segregated collection of uh, sanitary waste 
so that the workers have a better um, you know uh, working condition and also we used the law in 2013 that was uh, had come up which says um, manual scavenging or the touching of the uh, human feces is against the law so we use that law efficiently to uh, segregate that waste and collect it in 2011 only we had uh, started doing it and uh, wherever decentralized facilities are there either whether it is composting or dry waste collection center that was given to waste picker and uh, then citizen participation was very important for us because we wanted them to demand the services of waste pickers who had enjoyed their uh, their services and uh, so we did a lot of trainings to uh, formalize training from the city to the waste uh, to the citizen to engage in solid waste management and one of the major focus was in in terms of uh, waste picker integration um um and so um uh um, sorry one more minute okay so that is my last slide so inclusion of waste pickers it needs extremely important consistent Uh, message to the policy holders: consistent service, the, so that the waste, uh, the citizens are happy with it, and uh, working with all other sector people in the uh, as a stakeholder is very important. Bangalore has a huge uh, budget for solid waste management, so a lot of people are interested in that. So we had to carve out our role and our area where we could contribute to this whole uh, solid waste management system so waste pickers are integrated and they get some predictable income but our model is not of the cooperative but of the entrepreneurship and uh, we have about 82 entrepreneurs who are now filing the income tax return so um, yeah, so this has become uh, a way to work for us to when you want to scale up in a large city like bangalore um entrepreneurship also works quite well thanks thank you narini and thanks thanks both like lakshmi and narini for bringing us bringing to us these stories from from pune and from bangalore uh, so we can have now a few minutes um for question and answers and while participants uh we have one hand up already so alex please jump in Yes it's it's really interesting and congratulations on on a successful project I, and your efforts were yeah really rewarded it's, it's really nice to see um I'm curious about the during the covid-19 lockdowns I imagine having this integration recognition made it easy for them to be key workers and I'm wondering whether it's, it was you could clearly see the difference between bangalore and pune and the rest of the municipalities in india lakshmi you want to go first okay thanks uh, so uh, in pune it was uh, as i said since we have around 3 and 1/2000 waste pickers in pune and in pimpri chinchwad around 500 waste pickers who are part of the formal collection system in the sense they are not formal workers they are not contracted workers but it's their cooperative which offers a service to the municipality because of that those waste pickers actually continued to work through the pandemic they worked every single day even during the most intense lockdown Uh, in the initial days many of them were very scared to work but uh, all of us uh, as activists and the municipal senior staff also came to the streets to ensure that they were more comfortable emotionally to work of course at another level the municipality was completely incapable of providing personal protective equipment and other relief in time but uh, they of course needed a waste collection service to work and since the city depends on this the organized registered cooperative members were all working they were considered essential workers although the waste pickers of kkpkp are also considered registered workers they could not work because there was no waste for them to collect we know that waste quantities went down significantly at that time and there was not so much lit anyway overall in the first intense lockdown waste quantities significantly took a dip and at that time the problem was that waste pickers could not collect waste even if they wanted to because they needed to survive there was no waste to collect and there were no scrap shops because all these small shops were closed down pune for instance had one of the most intense lockdowns and for the first 3 months because we had a lot of cases 
So what happened was that we had a large number of waste pickers who didn't have work, who wanted work. And then we had a large number of waste pickers who had to work, whether they wanted to or not, because otherwise the risk was that waste would not get collected. Uh, they got all the support that they needed from the municipality, but they didn't get all the personal protective equipment, at least partly because the municipality was in no place to arrange for its own requirements either. So we mobilized, uh, I mean, and to be fair, that was true across the world, not only India, although India fared very, very badly. So uh, we had huge mobilization drives, civil society, philanthropies came forward big time and offered a lot of support. Citizens from whom the waste pickers collected waste came forward. We organized a lot of relief measures, not only for the waste pickers, but for other informal sector groups as well, because these were essential workers who were out on the streets. So even distribution of relief and ration and other stuff became easier for all of us. So we engaged in that very closely. In terms of vaccination also, uh, both uh, the Vigo studies have spoken about that. We, the, since the waste pickers of Pune were recognized as essential workers, the municipality took it upon them to cover them under the vaccination drives. So a good 5,000 of our waste pickers have taken at least one shot and 3,000 have taken both the shots. But uh, that doesn't, of course, mean that there was no vaccine as a hesitancy. Many of them uh, were positive. Many of them were symptomatic. Uh, we lost a few members or their family members to COVID. So they were definitely very heavily impacted, like Christie's study showed. They were more impacted, perhaps, than other worker groups as well. Does that answer mm -hmm. your question? So, uh, yeah, now, similarly, now yeah, similarly, in, sorry. When you respond to that question, just to flag that there's another question uh, for you uh, from Mariam. She's asking if you can explain why and how the city of Bangalore prioritized waste management. So what, a bit, what were their drivers or motivations? So if you can respond to, to both. I, I didn't understand. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so the question is like, why uh, did the city of Bangalore decide to prioritize waste management? What were their motivations or the... the... For decentralization? Yeah. For, for prioritizing waste management, for... for oh, prioritizing waste management, sure. So uh, like Lakshmi said, uh, similar kind of situation, about 3,000 people who are involved in door-to-door -door collection of waste uh, had, the, uh, had a really, really tough time. They couldn't even get food um, during uh, lunchtime, but they had to continue to work. There were a lot of uh, masks coming into dry waste, uh, for, uh, uh, which they were scared of. So yeah, um, the municipality could not manage to uh, provide any kind of services. So we also raised a lot of funds to support. And we, I think about 63,000 families we supported during that time. And uh, the major problem we had was the primary health care. Because uh, uh, most of the waste picker dependent on the quacks or the pharmaceutical uh, nearby, uh, I mean, pharmacies nearby, and not necessarily uh, to the uh, primary health care, but government primary health care, but they would go. But the, all the primary health care had converted into COVID centers. So no uh, worker was willing to go there. So we had to identify children of waste pickers who are studied, um, who are in colleges, we train them to become, um, you know, uh, preventive, just for the preventive measure. They would go check how many people are taking regular medication who are unable to take now because of pandemic, because uh, many of our people, because they uh, pick up a lot of weight, we have a lot of cardiac issues. And for the cardiac issues, medicine doesn't come free even in the government system. So we had to make sure that they are taking it because there is no daily wage job coming in so they will not uh, buy it. So we uh, no other uh, uh, health professionals were willing to go to the slum. Actually, the cases in waste picker community was very few. We work with 20,000 families. We had about five cases, but there was a fear to go into the community. So we really use a community children to as resources to go and do this. So that's an additional thing uh, what I wanted to share with uh, what Lakshmi has done. Similarly, we have done here. In terms of why uh, the local Bangalore government interested in waste management, because there was a huge uh, hue and cry uh, of the villages around the landfill. They did not allow the waste to come into the landfill uh, because they had had enough uh, of uh, uh, trouble with landfill leachate coming into their waters, uh, having so many mosquitoes that they have to sit inside uh, um, a uh, um, mosquito neck to eat food. 
so they were tired of it and they said one day they said we will not allow your waste to come into um, to our uh, our villages there were 20 30 tons of waste in each corner of the city piled up when you entered the city from airport you would get that stink you know because no there was no place to put it so uh, that became in, but by then we had already started working on a mm. dry waste collection center and said look this is the reason why you have to do decentralized you can't have it so they mm. found it as a very interesting um, uh, solution oriented um, you know a strategy for their own uh, waste and that's why they were interested to work with us thanks thanks that's really interesting like that combination of um, doing the groundwork and then using when there's a, a crisis or a moment, um, yeah, where it becomes becomes uh, particularly pressing. Thanks very much uh, for for the responses. I feel we have to move on now. Uh, so let me uh, hand over to Dr. Isaac Ruge Malila uh, from the Mazingira UG, UG Mazingira Waste Pickers Association, Tanzania. Dr. Isaac, uh, over to you. Uh, please unmute uh, yourself. Yeah. Okay. 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 So um, Isaac Rogemarila, uh, one of the co-founder and secretary of uh, Ushind Group uh, Mazingira in Tanzania, and uh, so today I'm just going to uh, explain about how we came to establish our association for West speakers, and um, uh, we do have a little bit of history about uh, waste picking activities. And uh, uh, this started early in 1990s. And uh, our approach is a bit different of how we came into uh, contact with other waste pickers is because uh, it was a part of my family business. And uh, uh, what we really found uh, was uh, uh, most of the waste picker were um, uh, using uh, drugs and uh, of course they were exposed to high risk of HIV. So what we did in early uh, 2000s, we were uh, came with approach of uh, like health education to them. And, uh, and then we saw a, necess a necessity of establishing uh, association for West speakers to address about their uh, livelihood and uh, other uh, things related to uh, like uh, have a public recognition of their work and the significant impact they bring to uh, our livelihood. Uh, so uh, we basically uh, have our uh, activities uh, in Dar es Salaam, which is one of the, it's like a business city in Tanzania. And uh, just a, a, a report uh, of what was happening in Dar es Salaam in terms of uh, West, uh, it has been showing that uh, there's a, a, a drastic increase of uh, waste with uh, challenge in uh, management. Uh, next slide, please. So we have, uh, it's, it's, not, it's just the same as other places where we have uh, various categories of waste like uh, liquid food products, plastic scraps and uh, rubber products. And uh, uh, the government rule is mainly to uh, acts as a supervisor of uh, these uh, activities, but still uh, it has not been able to manage to uh, reach all other, other places. And that's where the role of uh, West Pickers, which of course is in like an informal sector here in Tanzania, uh, comes in. So uh, up to now, the biggest challenge we are having is uh, a, a government recognition of these uh, uh, people. Uh, they have a significant contribution, but still, uh, like if you see uh, some of the, if they even organize themselves trying to seek uh, tenders for cleanness or uh, related activities, it's a big challenge. So these people have been experiencing a lot of challenges as, uh, next slide. Yeah, some sometimes they have been uh, punished in the streets, uh, like, uh, if they go maybe house house to house or in the streets trying to uh, 
uh, collect some waste is you, you have cases that people have been beat and uh, maybe uh, the, the, the public will think maybe they are free for something like that. Uh, so this is one of the challenge, but also uh, because they are not uh, recognized for those who are dealing with cleanness, uh, they have not been able to have uh, specific places for dumping their waste. Because uh, uh, in Dar es Salaam, there are places where uh, you can, you have like a big uh, isolated dump places, but uh, to get in there, you have to have uh, special permission. So these people will do those kind of work and then they don't have a place to, to dump them. So sometimes it becomes very challenging and uh, it might pose a public health concern. Uh, but also this has led to this group of people to work under pressure. And uh, as I said, uh, have been uh, in a long time denied opportunity to have equal chance of providing services, even if they're in a in a in a in a situation where I mean uh, in a in a step I mean a situation where they can do that. Next slide. Yeah. So you can see this is uh, uh, it's uh, managed by the government. Not all places, but this is one of the uh, 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 one of the. Uh, people who are dealing with uh, waste collection, but they are, many are supervised by the government. Uh, next slide. This is the same case scenario, next slide. Yeah, but you can see this is one of the places in between city of Tanzania, I mean Dar es Salaam, and this is where most of our uh, West Pika, who are not, uh, of course, formally recognized, dump their waste here. Uh, next slide. You can also see this is one of the other places. So next slide. So uh, all these uh, challenges uh, pushed us to establish uh, the association of. Uh, uh, West Pickers, and the, in uh, 2003 we had uh, our first move, where we organized with other West Pickers, and we 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 thought a need, we shared a need to establish our association. So we had the movement since 2003, and uh, in 2011 we had our uh, association registered. Next slide. Yeah. So the main goal, as I said, was to create a platform for West Africa to have a public and government recognition and to conduct their activities in a formal way uh, that uh, would alleviate the challenge they face. Uh, our association is a membership-based association, and to the best of our knowledge, it's the first uh, association for West speakers in our country. Next slide. This is the certificate of registration. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, we also found that in the campaign of uh, uh, trying to uh, advocate for uh, the recognition of our West speakers, we also found that most of these uh, people were dealing with uh, by the time it was more, more of uh, people were dealing with cleanness, but also most of them, they are dealing with recycling activities. So uh, in, a, in, a, in an effort to uh, help them have uh, recognition, but also better their livelihood, we, start with, we thought, uh, and we found a need to establish another, uh, a cop, I mean, uh, another initial, uh, association, which is more of a cooperative association. And uh, these were linking between the West speakers and the middle buyers. Uh, and the issue were like, uh, we, uh, we did have a West speaker, but the, where we should uh, sell the, 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 the recycling uh, uh, products was, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we formulated this uh, to link them, but also to uh, have a voice to, uh, to, to West speaker in terms of uh, uh, doing the uh, business activities with the, uh, middle buyer, but also we included middle buyers who have a voice to uh, where we, most of us sell our products like in, uh, in uh, industries. So in 2011, we also had a, 
establishment of uh, Mazavira Cooperative Society. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, these are where the, the challenges we, so we, 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 we faced, like uh, most of the people who are dealing with uh, waste picking activities, we are working in the most uh, risky environment. So there's the, the chance of having infectious disease, uh, like HIV was, was very uh, significant because you can see some of the uh, sharp, uh, I mean, human waste like uh, sharp uh, needle will just be uh, thrown anywhere. And these people, they don't have uh, the gadgets to, 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 to work. So it was a very challenging and uh, we, we thought the need of uh, addressing this issue. Uh, so lacking of working gears is still a challenge up to now. Uh, conducive environment also to store their uh, materials like uh, warehouses and for middle buyers, like uh, machines that are used for uh, recycling activities. But uh, so we, we, we saw there's a need to set a uh, business friendly uh, setting uh, to conduct their, their, their deals because like uh, in, in our setting, most of the people who decide how much they should buy is, is the industries, those who have power to do that. So we, we thought a need to intervene on that and also uh, uh, have, a, have a common ground to decide uh, on the profitable uh, basis to our, uh, to our members and to the people who are the main buyers. Next slide, please. So this is a certificate of Mazingira Cooperative Society. Next slide. You have uh, one minute, Dr. Isaac. Okay, so the rest is uh, just pictures, if you can go through them. Yeah. You can just go through them, yes. So what were our achievements? First, uh, we were able to organize uh, West speakers in the, in the country and uh, in one point of time, it was in 2019, the government issues, uh, issued entrepreneurial identities, and we had to advocate on the importance of uh, West speakers to have entrepreneurial identities, where they would uh, identify as, uh, uh, as workers, as other former, formalized workers. So we did that, and most of our members had uh, entrepreneurial identities. Uh, we still continue to educate and advocate on environmental sustainability through recycling of waste,s and uh, we have been able to establish good uh, relationship at least at the level of municipal level with our our city. And uh, in 2019, we, also, we had a privilege to uh, host a con international conference on recycling and inclusive inclusive cities in, in Tanzania. And uh, also uh, through Mazingira Cooperative, we are able to get some grants from the government and uh, uh, most of the, our member were able to uh, strengthen and uh, establish their, uh, I mean, uh, their uh, businesses through uh, recycling waste. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a little bit of, uh, of the profile of how we did and how we uh, came to have our associations. Yeah, so Thanks. you're welcome, yeah. Thank you very much, that was, that was great. Um, so we have now 10, 10 minutes left uh, for, for question to, to Dr. Isaac and also more, more generally to any of the, of the speakers. Um, I wanted to start with with one question, Dr. Isaac, on the on the extent to which this the, the, the work that you've talked about is um, mainly on solid waste, and if you have any connections or any thoughts about um, the workers that are dealing more with with fecal waste, like the pit empties, are there any overlaps or any connections there? uh sorry come again yeah no so i was wondering like um if if in your work and the efforts to to set up the cooperative 
if you have had any connections with workers that are working on uh, pit emptying and the fecal waste uh, rather than solid waste. So people that are emptying pits or septic tanks, because some of the challenges are similar, like they don't have a dumping site for the fecal yeah. waste. And so yeah. I was wondering if there, if you saw any um, yeah, connections, there are any overlaps. Oh, yeah, it's true. It is. There is uh, most of our members, they deal with all sorts of kind of works. So they'll be dealing with the waste picking, but others will deal with uh, empty, uh, being emptying and others will do such kind as we say. So we, um, we include all of them and uh, still the challenge is very similar to most of them. Uh, so uh, we try to handle all kind of situations through our society. Thanks. Um, so while uh, here's a question in the chat box. Um, do you also have female members in your cooperative? Yes, we do have a lot of female members in our cooperative. Uh, I really don't have uh, statistics, but it's around 30 to 40 percent. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So while more questions uh, come in, I'll, I'll extend the, the question to, to Lakshmi and Nalini on those overlaps between um, yeah, solid waste and, and fecal waste, because um, I mean, we haven't spoken today much about the, the cast dimensions of, of the work in, in India and the subcontinent. But I was, I was wondering, because many times uh, pickers and, and uh, fecal waste workers like uh, pit emptiers, uh, they sometimes are belong to the same family. Uh, so I don't know if you, if that's something that uh, came across your work and, and any thoughts you may have also on how applicable some of the work you have been doing would be for the sanitation workers, for those dealing with fecal waste. Um, Nelly, should I respond and then you want to? So uh, the thing is that generally there are, of course, there's a huge community of, uh, in India, the terminology that is typically used to refer to them is scavengers, manual scavengers who are working with fecal waste. And it's generally a different community from the waste pickers. They do very different work, although both are as stigmatized and problematic in many ways. I think the position that waste picker groups in India and globally have taken is uh, unlike the manual scavengers who have uh, taken a course of arguing that this is not the kind of work that anyone should be doing. Uh, I think generally the argument waste picker groups that have taken is definitely that the way waste pickers work in the manner in which they work is not desirable. Uh, collecting waste, uh, fighting with rodents and pigs and dogs and at landfills to retrieve paper tin metal plastic goes against human sen sensitivities. And we don't advocate that that kind of work continues. But equally, we believe that some form of waste management exists in many cities. And therefore, it would be good if waste pickers could occupy those spaces, which allow opportunities for green, decent work for enhanced conditions of work. The caste uh, relationship with uh, both waste picking and manual scavenging is very high. There are very specific caste communities in India who are engaged in both works. They're not the same in every region. So in Pune, for instance, those who do manual scavenging are sometimes from different castes some of the subcasts are different. But anyway, that's that's hardly the point. Within waste picking, we do see, not in very significant numbers, but we do see that as conditions of work improve and there is a little more formalization, there's a little more collectivization, empowerment, dignity, uh, other caste groups start entering, not in very large numbers. I'm not claiming at all that the caste demographics of waste picking has changed in Pune, but definitely you see more males in Swatch who want to come forward and become members, whereas typically waste picking used to be far more female dominated. In the same way, you see the entrance of new caste groups. You see activists sometimes or uh, coordinators who have worked in the Swatch Cooperative who come from middle castes or lower castes, but not castes that are traditionally uh, associated with waste picking, who actually move to collecting waste in, as Swatch workers, move from staff to collecting of waste because they find that that is more economically viable. So uh, there is definitely a problematic caste relationship that needs to be countered. Equally, we feel that the community should have the agency and the decision-making ability to determine whether they want to actually carve and preserve this space 
for themselves, which has been an argument in many uh, parts of India, that this work of waste picking should be protected and kept reserved for people from certain communities who have been doing the work for the longest time. And only when they choose not to do it, should it be open to other groups. So that's the kind of perspective, that's a kind of uh, stand that waste picker groups have typically taken. Nalini, want to add? Yeah, I think um, um, she has covered uh, almost everything. Uh, uh, when you improve the condition of work, others come. Um, uh, that is very, very clear. Um, even in uh, manual scavenging in Bangalore, uh, you know, in Bangalore, um, there are still, uh, there is a, a group of people who are doing it, um, unrecognized and unseen. The dude in the nights, it is happening in a big city like Bangalore also. Recently, last week, we had a death of a 16-year-old child um, uh, used uh, by one of the contractors. So the caste, I think it is not necessarily the same community, same family. We have done a, a, a you know entire city of Trichy, which is in Tamil Nadu. All kinds of sanitation workers, uh, including the sludge uh, operators, sanitation workers of the city, and the waste pickers, and they are not necessarily from the same com same families. So um, they, they, there is a huge difference uh, in the uh, communities they come from within the community. I mean, but they are all basically from Dalit communities. Thanks. Um, I don't know if there, there are any other questions that I'm, I'm missing, but uh, maybe a very quick one, uh, just uh, one minute for uh, for colleagues from Uego. Uh, it's also, I mean, we've discussed a bit, Sonia, but I think it would be useful to to reflect here, like what, what do you see as um, potential synergies between the work that you are doing and, and the work on, on sanitation workers? Uh, just any any reflections you may have also from from some of the latest exchanges and and from this week you want to go first christy or um I? I think maybe if you go first because because uh, i know that you know you, you have um a lot of um a lot of your work interfaces with sanitation workers more directly yes uh i i think one of these things that has been really interesting me since we have been engaging more within our working group, uh, the sanitation uh, workers' health and safety, dignity, and also other engagement that I've been having with people working on the sanitation. I'm really uh, interested in terms of uh, mapping what whether people uh, from sanitation as, uh, as, you know, mechanization and modernization is brought forward within sanitation as a whole. Uh, I'm really interested to see if people are migrating into ways picking, you know, the, the kind of, uh, of workers that we, both of us, work more. Uh, and I have uh, noted some reports about that coming from colleagues. And so I think there is a, a, a lot of room for research in terms of trying to map, you know, migration from one work to the other, the impacts of modernization in the sector as a whole. The other thing that for me, it's really uh, interesting and it's a room for cooperation is is destigmatization. This is a big issue. It has been for all of these workers. I think uh, we can see in, in this room, you know, the experience that we that um, our colleagues from India and also Tanzania have shared. It's all around, you know, uh, raising the status uh, of the of of, of these uh, people as workers. And I think we perhaps we can learn a lot and build solidarity across sectors. We need more cross-sector solidarity as a whole within informal workers, street traders, uh, home-based workers, you name it. And of course, within the sanitation sector, I think there is a lot of room for solidarity and cross-sector work. I, you know, I, I'll stop there, but we can have more, uh, you know, dedicated engagement on this. 
Thanks, thanks, Sonia. And um, yeah, I think we are we are at time now. So I just wanted to to thank everyone for the participation. I think Sonia has also uh, done a bit of a summary of some of the common threads that were emerging. So I I won't try to to do that. Um, but yeah, I think um, and and also thanks for there have been a couple of questions that have have been answered in the chat box. So thanks uh, to to those posting questions and responding. And um, yeah, I just hope that uh, we can keep this conversation going through different channels because I think there's a lot to learn and I feel the solid waste and uh, waste picking sectors have are a bit ahead of the sanitation sector in many respects so I think there's a lot that um, that can be learned and that a lot of lessons that uh, we can learn the easy way rather than the the painful way of of making mistakes so I think we should try to definitely build build on those uh, so without without um, yeah taking more of your time, thanks to all the participants, all the speakers, and also to the uh, organizers for all the the work uh, that they've put on this. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good uh, day evening. Thanks everyone.